Uh, okay, we're live. Hey, my name is Joe Gilder. Welcome to this webinar where we're going to give you a bunch of good, hard-hitting, mixing, mastering content to help you go like mix or master something tonight and make it awesome. That's that's the goal. And what do I mean when I say we? I mean, of course, not just me, but my longtime audio buddy and mastering engineer, Ian Shepard, who's hiding around here somewhere. Ian, show yourself. There he is. I'm here. I had to dispatch a message that said, you've removed your audio. And I was like, I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, silly goose. All right. So y'all can see and hear us. That is good news. Um, so fun fact, y'all. I may have, some of you may already know this, but this month, April 2024 is my 15th anniversary of the first time I started posting anything on a little YouTube channel called Home Studio Corner. And early in those early days, there was a guy who shared one of my videos about, I think it was compression. And of course, in those early days, you obsess over where, where'd that link come from? Where, who is this guy? His name's Ian and he's British and that's awesome. Um, it was Ian Shepard. So, uh, and ever since we've been best of friends. So everyone welcome Ian. Ian, thanks for being on. This is going to be really fun. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I think it was EQ, not compression. Yeah. Um, in fact, it's still there. I was I was going to share it, and then I thought maybe I shouldn't because maybe I should check with you because you think you've deleted that video, but it's still there. No, I don't I think, think I deleted it. It's just an old YouTube. I feel like I found it. Um, but yeah, it was it was many, many, many years ago. Many hairs ago also. <laughs> <laughs> so. In my case, many, many grays ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. We just we just have more credibility. So, um, in the in the chat, let us know that you're ready to go, and we're gonna jump in. So the way this is gonna work, typically, Ian's my go to mastering guy. Um, I learned so much. Probably I, I I say I've learned everything I know about mastering. I learned from Ian, um, which is fairly true, honestly. Um, and so obviously, I talk a lot more about mixing. And so with our powers combined, we can get a whole song. <laughs> <laughs> done um, together. So what we're going to do is actually go through, we're going to share six different mixing and mastering game changers, but with a twist, Ian's going to share the mixing game changers and I'm going to share the mastering game changers. And then we might fight about it afterwards. So, um, and see if we agree with one another, but I see a bunch of folks in the chat. I think they're ready to go. So why don't we kick it off with Ian, with your first mixing game changer. Go. Okay. So, uh, people who know me won't be surprised by this one particularly, but um, it, it it's pretty simple. Without quiet, there can be no loud. Um, everybody is always talking about loudness, and it's a complicated subject, and we don't have to go too deep in it. That's absolutely fine with me. But for me, loudness is all about contrast, right? If something is loud all the way through, nothing will sound quiet, and it won't sound loud because it has nothing to compare against. Um, and that applies just as much in mixing as it does in mastering, probably more so, I would say. So when I'm mixing, um, I'm thinking, I'm not thinking about the overall loudness at all, really. Um, I have my monitor gain set higher than I do when I'm mastering, so that the levels can actually be lower and I've got more space for the peaks, so I don't have to worry about clipping anything or adding a limiter or any of that kind of stuff. I've got kind of complete creative freedom. Um, but I'm thinking really carefully about how the verse relates to the chorus, how the intro sits, where things end up. You know, I'm thinking, how loud is the loudest section? How does everything else compare? So definitely planning the what I call the internal dynamics of the mix. Um, so, or the macro dynamics. Yeah, there's micro dynamics, which is how much limiting and peak level crush there is, and then there's macro dynamics, which is what is the difference between one song and another on an album or within a song? What's the difference between the verse and the chorus? Um, but the twist I'm going to throw on this is to say, although dynamics and contrast are super important, quite often you don't need as much as you might think. Hmm. Um, for me, I mean, I don't like putting numbers on things, but just as a <laughs> rough rule of thumb, I would say somewhere between four and two dB difference between the verse and the chorus can often be enough. Um, because there's all kinds of other clues if your mix and your arrangement are working well that kind of give clues as to 
what's happening. There's all kinds of stuff that you can do to make a chorus feel big and loud that doesn't actually have anything to do with level. And if you have too much contrast between the verse and the chorus, then when somebody's got their uh, hi-fi or their stereo, their earbuds, whatever it is, cranked up for the verse, then the chorus will come in and just blow them away and they'll be annoyed rather than um, exhilarated, which, you know, the, the goal you want to be going, yes, right. not ow. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's a question of finding a balance between those two things. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's super important. It's, um, and kind of relates to a tip I'm going to do a little bit later as well. So I'll come back to that, but okay. I'm curious what your response to that is. Jim. What would you, what would you say? I have a question and then I'll respond. So what would you say? So without quiet, there can be no loud. So let's make sure we have dynamics in kind of everything we do. When you, when you come across something, someone maybe hired you to master and there is it doesn't have that dynamics. What does that mean? And what is, what would be your prescription to them? What's the typical way you see this presenting itself in a mix? So the most common thing is that people have pushed things too hard into say a bus compressor, mm, right? Okay. Um, you know, it's I like, for me, I was, when I learned to mix, I didn't have a bus compressor available to me. Um, this was, this was a long time ago in the early days of digital <laughs> when like literally, you know, I had, I think I had three digital compressors available to me at that point. It wasn't like, you know, there was, I don't think even Cubase audio was a thing. God, it was mm -hmm. so long ago. Um, <laughs> but, but the, so that meant that I was really kind of sparing with what I did. So I did have often some EQ on the, the stereo output, but I would not typically have a, a bus compressor. Now, lots of people do have bus compression. That's absolutely fine. That's, you know, top down mixing. It's a great way to work. You can get great results and it's an important part of the sound in lots of genres. Mm -hmm. Um, but the risk is, well, for example, let's say you have got a big contrast between your verse and your chorus. So you push your verse or you push the whole level up into the mix bus compressor so that the verse sounds good and then the chorus comes in and actually it's then hitting the compressor way too hard, right? So like it's constantly in gain reduction, you know, that thing where it doesn't ever let go mm -hmm. um, and it's probably pumping and moving around weirdly as well. That's a common problem. Mm -hmm. um, you can have the opposite where um, they have actually reduced the amount of contrast between the verse and the chorus so that everything is hitting it too hard. I mean, I guess I would sum it up by saying the most common thing is just too much mixed bus compression. Mm. Um, and what I, I don't kind of, I'm there, there are different kind of mastering engineers. I'm not the kind of guy who, as soon as I get something from somebody says, no, that's wrong. Do it again. Um, right. I mean, there are people who work like that and their clients love them. So maybe I should, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I always kind of try and have respect for what people are, are giving me. I can have empathy for what they they're trying to achieve. So I will do my best with what I've been given and then say to them, I would love to do an experiment. I feel like maybe I could get more out of this if there was just a little bit more room to breathe in the in the mix bus compression. Are you interested in the idea of doing an experiment where you just ease back on the, the input to that compressor a bit and send me another mix? Um, and sometimes they say yes, and sometimes they say no. Um, what I will say is that I have a 100% track record, literally, of when they, when they say, yes, let's try that experiment. I end up with getting a master that we are both happier with, that they're happier mm -hmm. with, and that mm -hmm. I'm happy with. It might be just as loud as their mix originally was, or even a little bit louder, but I, it gives me more flexibility at the mastering stage. So in terms of mixing, I would say, by all means, use stereo mix bus compression. Just be careful not to overdo it. Um, mm -hmm. I dig that a lot. And I would say from a lot of critiques and stuff that I've done too, the other piece is if you never really had dynamic in the performance to begin with, it's real hard to kind of force it in there later. You start over compressing to try to make something punch or you have to automate a bunch and that stuff can be helpful, right? You've had that chorus that just doesn't have the lift and you automate the volume of the whole drum kit in the chorus and suddenly it feels great. But if it's not already, like I, I've noticed some of my favorite like singer songwriters, when I go to watch them perform live, it's amazing how just a guitar and a vocal, they have this wide dynamic range. You'd think they're limited because they don't have a huge band behind them, but they almost are have even more dynamic because they can go super loud on both instruments to super quiet um, within the span of just a verse and a chorus. Um, and so I always try to make sure we're injecting that into the stuff we produce um, so that like raw by itself, it already hits you in the gut and makes you feel things. And then, then when you come to mix and master, just make sure you don't lose that. 
That's good. All right, Ian off to a good start. That's one point for Ian. Kudos. Um, Is this a competition? I didn't realize that. (laughs) I just made it just now. Everything's a competition because I'm American. All right. Uh, All right, so my first mastering tip, mastering game changer, if you will, is learn to love the meters. Um, Mixing, I don't pay attention to the meters as much, but mastering, they can tell you a lot. Now, the, the flip side, if, if you go too far, then you just look at everything and you base all your creative decisions on what's happening on some bouncing light. That's not great. But there's a lot you can learn, both in kind of what's going on loudness wise and what's going on frequency balance wise, that the the meters can be like a good right hand co-pilot in that process, especially I feel like we our ears are beautiful things, but they are jerks sometimes because you put you you know you make the bass way too loud in your master and within a minute your ears are used to it and it just sounds normal now and you've lost all perspective and so if i'm mastering and i see man there's a huge bump down there at 50 hertz that when i listen to well balanced stuff i don't typically see that so it at least gives me some pause to say well let me go give that another listen or let me take a break and come back and say oh yeah maybe i put too much low end into that thing um, so yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a delicate balance. Um, but especially from going from one song to the next, when I'm not sure how like volume wise, is this, is this balanced from song one to song two, uh, having the meters kind of give me some feedback and say, okay, okay. Yeah, it is three dB louder. Okay. My ears aren't crazy. Um, a lot of times it's confirming that I'm not crazy, which for me means a lot. So <laughs> what do you think about that, sir? No, absolutely. Same. Um, it, I mean, the, the proving I'm not crazy thing. I saw a comment down here from uh, from Bo saying phase meter, and I would agree with that. A correlator mm. that gives you an idea of the stereo spread or one of those kind of jellyfish displays. Those are also cool. Yeah, I mean, again, it's uh, we have to be careful not to mix or master with our eyes, um, but especially when you're starting out and, and especially when you're just trying to figure out what you're hearing, you know, what makes that thing sound so great and why does my sound mine sound different? Looking at the frequency curve or looking at the level meter or whatever it might be using a loudness meter to notice how much contrast there is, you know, is it two to three dBs, four dBs between the verse and the chorus, or is it more, is it less? Um, All of that stuff I think is super useful. And the frequency display meters that you get, I mean, again, I remember, I promise I'm not going to spend the whole thing evening talking about how old I am, but, but when I started out, I literally had a six band, um, I don't even know what you call it, a little frequency meter, right? Okay. So just little blocks, LEDs, blocks going up and down. The interesting thing is that was actually quite cool. So I would say anybody who is, I've got two tips for my t- types of meters. One of them is if you want to have a, a a frequency meter, don't go for one that's too detailed. Um, mm. So there's a free one called Span made by Voxengo, which uh, has a mastering mode, which is really cool because it turns this incredibly detailed, really beautiful looking frequency into this kind of, broad wobbly lumpy thing and it's it's actually really helpful because it you can notice what you what you were saying about is there a huge lump down there it's not too fast and it's not too detailed so that would be my suggestion for a frequency meter and not necessarily span but wh- whichever one you're using get one that's not too detailed um and then in terms of loudness um i got really hauled over the coals for suggesting this in a facebook group recently but i'm going to stick to my guns <laughs> i I recommend the uh, an emulation of a, an old style needle VU meter. Um, yes. it's, it's a running joke in the industry that VU stands for virtually useless, and that's virtually useless advice. <laughs> VU meters are fantastically uh, helpful. You, th- they're a bit quirky. They're very sensitive to bass, um, so you need to be careful with them. But like Waves do one. My favorite is made by Klanghelm, the VUMT Klanghelm Vumped. Um, there's a, there's a bunch of them out there now. The main thing is you have to calibrate them. So when you first install them, they're probably going to be set so that zero point is at minus 18, which is, in my opinion, a great place to be for mixing. So once you're, if your mix is going full tilt, the loudest section of your song, if it's calibrated to minus 18 and it's pushing one or two dB above zero, mm-hmm. that's probably a great place to be. Um, and then you just want to look out for, going back to the previous tip in the verse, making sure that the needle just doesn't disappear. Um, Whereas when you're mastering, I would recommend you have it calibrated about minus 11. Um, And again, pushing up to plus one, plus two at the loudest sections. Um, 
I could talk for hours about that, so I won't go into any more detail. But the reason I like a VU so much is actually, if, I don't know if you guys can imagine one, but it's basically that it maxes out at plus three, which way is maximum for you guys. There, it maxes out at plus three. Then the zero is kind of more or less straight up. And you go across to about there, and your own, it's like minus seven or minus eight, and then it drops off to minus 30 in that bit down there, which means that mm -hmm. it's super sensitive around the zero point. Mm -hmm. So it's not like I'm saying you should aim for that, but if you have in mind, I mean, even if you calibrate it differently, right? If you, you could bring in your favorite thing and just t tweak the setting until the needle is hovering around zero and use that as your reference. However you do it, it makes it super easy to see if you've either slammed it or actually if the level has just dropped way, way down. Um, so yeah, those are my two metering tips. Um, and because, yeah, I definitely agree. And I don't know if this is, I mean, obviously this isn't the main reason, but one reason why making sure it hits at similar volumes from one project to the next is your ears are going to hear that a lot more. You're going to get more consistent results if you're hearing things at consistent volumes. Because what happens when you hear things that are really loud and the things that are really quiet, you're going to hear the low end differently because of all the nerdy Fletcher Munson stuff happening. So like, you're literally going to hear a bass boost if you go super loud on this project and then you make the next one super quiet and you have a real hard time making things sound consistent from one project to the next. So I like to, once I've got it set up, I, I like to not touch the volume on my speakers and keep constantly tweaking so that I'm, I'm having a consistent response coming out of it. And do you do that at mixing as well? Because I definitely do that at mastering. Do you do that when mm -hmm. you're mixing? Mm -hmm. I have like a mix, mix position for the volume knob and a mastering position. And I, I almost, the only time I move it is like if it's during recording and I just need to crank things just to like, just because you want to hear how loud and awesome things sound when the drummer's here. But no, otherwise it's, there's one spot for mixing, one spot for mastering. I've done that for, for years, which means yeah. if it's, even if it's the wrong spot, I've done it for years. So we're good, right? I get consistent results, even if it's too quiet or too loud or whatever. Probably too yep. quiet. Absolutely. Nope. Definitely agree. All right. Um, I, I am giving myself more, right? a point. I'm giving myself a point for that one. That's fair. I'm, I'm going to allow that. You can tell he's um, not okay with that. You see it? I see it. Okay, so it's it's my turn again, right? <laughs> yes, go. Um, okay, so basically, uh, this is uh, this is this tip is to, to keep it simple. Um, I believe this about mastering as well, but in mixing, I believe level EQ and compression will get you eighty or ninety percent of the way to a mix. I mean, I would go further than that and say that level will get you. 60% of the way, so but by which I mean just getting the right balance between the faders, you know, really thinking carefully about what's the kick and the snare relationship, how does the bass sit with that, where are the rhythm guitars in that, where's the bass guitar, and, and building, however you start, whether you start from the vocal and build out, or whether you start from the drums, I was, I was taught in a live sound situation, so it was like kick, snare, hat, you know, rack one, rack two, all that stuff, um, but yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter, but if you can get the right level balance, and if the band are in tune, that, that, I'm sneaking that one. Is, is, is <laughs> I don't know whether you've noticed this. If 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 the players are out of tune, a great mix is almost impossible. When everybody's in tune, everything goes that much easier. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. I could I could go off on that. <laughs> yeah, I, I imagine you could. And somebody is going to say in the comments, Girats. Um, but um, <laughs> the so level first, then EQ. Well, level then panning. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I'm not a particular, I, I know lots of people suggest mixing in mono. I see the logic behind that. I don't do it. I'm too much of a fan of stereo. Yeah, um, I, I just, I just get in there and start spreading things out because I just love wide drums and all the rest of it. But um, those two things will give you so much control and so much space. Um, then it's EQ. Um, and it's, it's, you know, just making sure that things aren't fighting in the same frequency range, making st sure that, you know, things sound consistent um if you're feeling like everything needs more bass then absolutely put an eq on the the stereo mix bus um but if it's you know you you do that and you bring up the low end it's like oh the bass guitar is a bit lumpy we'll get in there and, and tune that with an eq before in my opinion you put in some compression mm -hmm. um and then compression is the kind of the final stage to that that's going to really help and I kind of, I almost made this tip just to be able to make the point that I'm not anti-compression because, you know, <laughs> right. I made yeah. dynamic range day. I've done the, the loudness plugins. I, I'm always talking about loudness, all the rest of it, but I, I love heavy compression in, especially in a mix. I love it in a master as well, but it's, you know, it's, it's compression and limiting are essential parts mm -hmm. of a modern mix. So, um, 
yeah, those three things. The one thing that I would say about compression is, and this goes back to something that you were saying, Joe, about, I mean, I agree with you, you need dynamics in the performance, but also you need automation. To, mm -hmm. to help kind mm -hmm. of keep things so if you if you have somebody who's gently strumming an acoustic guitar and then really starts hitting it hard it will suddenly get too loud there's two ways to deal with that you could put a compressor on or you could just automate down the louder section you know like in the old days you would have pulled the fader back in the mix mm -hmm. right i mean mm -hmm. you had five or six people down the desk and it would be a kind of team <laughs> effort yeah but, but um and so that's that's kind of manual compression if you like except it's great because it has no artifacts there's no attack release times to get wrong. There's no threshold settings that to be not quite right. You just literally, so it's, it's going back to level, except that it's leveling as you go along. Um, and yeah, if you, if you build those things in, you can get, I mean, I actually, I'm not going to talk about how old I am and how long ago it was all, all, all evening, but the first ever professional recording and mix I did was for Kenny Ball and his jazz men. Kenny was mm -hmm. old by that point. I mean, he's like, he's, he's a legend. Um, but I had, so so it was, the, we had a 20-bit recording system. It was one of the first 20-bit recording systems ever available, videotape cartridges. Eight tracks. I only had eight tracks. So I was mixing down ooh, most of the drums to stereo, and then I had two, it was combining two basings. And I, I, only, I think I only had four compressors available to me. So, but I had flying faders. So the automation in that mix mm -hmm. was insane. Mm -hmm. And I am still so proud of that of that mix of the result that we achieved with minimal compression. And the what I kind of learned coming from there through to where I am now, where I can have a compressor on every channel in a 128 channel mix, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is as soon as you add compression to one thing, it becomes I'm not going to say necessary, but more likely you're going to need it on other things mm -hmm. because as soon as you turn one uneven varied thing that was part of a musical performance into a much more consistent linear thing that just kind of mm -hmm. goes along suddenly when somebody else gets quiet they drop below it and then they poke out above it and suddenly they sound you notice how inconsistent that is and you have to use compression there and then mm -hmm. and i'm not even saying it's over compression it's just some compression um mm -hmm. so yeah it's uh it's fantastic but it's also if you can use it as minimally as possible at least to begin with, I feel that's that's a great place to be. I've been talking a lot. You can now. No, uh, I like it. The, the idea of minimalism connects with me so deeply because I, I remember back in my days of working at Sweetwater selling equipment, one of my favorite things to do would be if you called me to say, hey, what's your price on this? And for me to convince you that that wasn't what you needed, but you needed something else that was probably a lot cheaper and would do the job better. Um, it was, it was fun because a, it, it was just a fun game to play, but, but I also did it because it was true. So like people say, man, what, you know, they'll ask me, what's the best compression setting to get this guitar to sit better? Cause it gets louder from the verse to the chorus. And I'm like, I disagree with your question because yeah, com they think compression turns things down. Sure. But it does a lot of other things. And the best way to turn things down is just to go, just to turn it down. And so you can automate, you can do, uh, somebody in the chat was saying, you know, clip gain, there's a thousand ways to change volume, a thousand, um, but it doesn't have to be compression. Compression's cool and does lots of cool things, but it, for like strict volume control, especially from section to section, it doesn't work super well because it's, it's always letting it back up when it smushes it back down. So like the transient might be the right volume, but then the sustain is too loud and you're now you're trying two compressors, one for the transient, one for the sustain when all you needed to do was say it with me, just turn it down. Um, I love the idea of like, like Occam's razor. The simplest solution is oftentimes the best. Not always. Sometimes you got to slam that sucker with two compressors because it just loves it. But a lot of times, especially stuff like that specific thing, people have this like, it's almost like a clinical, like educational, like, like professor approach to it. I think because of these reasons, this will work well when in reality, like compressor was just the wrong tool to begin with. And as much as you kind of try to wrap your head around a reason, um, it's funny on the, on the, the live streams with Gregor that we do for studio one, we'll regularly disagree on, he'll say, yeah, that guitar was too quiet in the verse. Some compression will help bring that up. And I'm always thinking, Ooh, we just turn it up, maybe. So both probably get the job done, but my way's better. <laughs> I love I give I'm giving myself another point for that one. You can have another point. I'll give you a bonus. Well, am I gonna give you a bonus <laughs> point? I would give you a bonus point if it didn't mean that you might win because Fair. 
uh, j- just for saying I disagree with your question, not even disagreeing with the answer. It's like I disagree with the with the question you're asking, right. let alone what the answer might be. It's like the secret to wisdom is to ask better questions or to be willing to say, maybe it's not even the right question that I'm asking. The um, question, yeah, the question you really wanted to answer what, ask was, mm-hmm. um, I've just seen in the chat that Johnny has uh, played with Kenny. I did not realize that. That's extremely what? cool. What? Um, the so, so the mystery little, that is Johnny Lipsham. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, that's so that's my second one. So, um, All right. I oh, I'm two one up. Okay, you're winning now. Great. Um, all right. So my second mastering tip is this is my favorite. Know what you gotta know what good sounds like in your studio. I say this all the time, but it's this weird phenomenon that happens, especially in the home studio world. So like it probably is foreign to somebody like Ian. Like you you've worked in like big proper mastering studios with tens of thousands of dollars of equipment just to make it sound good. And then your space, I remember when you built it, it is tuned and made to sound as good as possible in your space. Um, But for a lot of people, they're coming into a home studio and the only thing they ever listen to in that space, even if it's imperfect, the only thing they listen to is the stuff they're working on. So they listen to their current mix. They listen to their current mastering session. And then they take that out to the Sono speaker or the car stereo. And they think, well, it doesn't sound anything like my favorite music. And they come back to the studio. And then what do they listen to? The thing that doesn't sound very good. And they continue to try. It's, it's it when you can get them to realize that, Hey, 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 you, you're trying to, it's like you're trying to paint a picture without ever seeing the thing you're trying to paint. So give yourself some time to sit in your mix position where you do your music and set aside time to listen to really good music and internalize what that sounds like, all the different things, whether it's where the vocal sits, how the bass sits, what the drums do, how loud it is, all of those things. And you'll start to, it's not going to be like you do it today and tomorrow you're a pro, but it will, it it grounds you in reality so that when you flip over to your songs, some of those problems will start to stand out a little more. Like, oh, my mid-range is way louder than anything I ever listened to. Or, wow, I had no bass in my mix. But when I listened to pro mixes, I realized, oh, okay, they actually, you're allowed to have some bass. And that's what I've loved about anything you've ever mastered for me, Ian, is you're not afraid to let it have a nice big bottom end to it. Um, that's another point for me. Um, and, and so I would say the, the it's not so much that I'm all about like referencing in the sense of like flipping over to it in the middle of a session but more just internalizing what good music sounds like here so that when I do work on my music, it's a lot more obvious where the problems are. Yeah, I completely agree. I'm going to take your point because I'm pretty sure I blogged about this years ago and you stole it from me. But Fair. anyway, um, the I'm, I'm going to pick up on two po- kind of parts of what you said and, and kind of reinforce them. One of them is, yes, I started out working in a, in a, a pro mastering studio that had hundreds of thousands worth of gear in it. But I still had to listen to it. it. It sounded amazing, but it sounded so different to anything I'd ever heard before. I mean, the speakers were half as high as I am, you know, and just <laughs> the, the quality was astonishing. So the bass would literally, you know, you'd, you'd feel it. And I, I just was not used to that. It took me a good deal of time to, to I, I, in fact, I remember the first album, The Nick Watson, who now works at Fluid Mastering, who um, was one of my mentors, came in and, and he he'd listened to the master that I'd done my first attempt. And he's like, yeah, you don't need to do any of that. You know, these speakers do that for you, right? You need to not do that because if you do, you'll just have too much. Um, So it applies to everybody, even in a a, a fully acoustic. I mean, the other thing is even an acoustically designed room, nobody's room sounds perfect and every room interacts with the monitoring system. So it's not like anybody is exempt from this. And then the other thing I would say is you don't even have to set aside time. I would say just, stick music on in the background when Mm -hmm. you're doing emails when you're uh doing your accounts when you're uh, soldering sorry soldering how do you say it soldering soldering when (laughs) when you're soldering Soldering. um you're putting xlr cables together whatever it is just anytime you're not actually working on your music have other music on playing um, mm-hmm. I saw a question in the chat kind of, um, it's hard to keep up. There's so many comments coming in, but it, it flew past and it said, what would be a recommended artist to use? Mm-hmm. I mean, I kind of have two answers to that. One is whichever artist you would like your music to sound like um, mm-hmm. is, a, is a good reference, but actually it doesn't matter. 
in some ways, hearing a huge range of everything is even more useful because just over time, it subconsciously filters in that, oh, this is how that genre sounds. And this is, and then when you get, a, I don't know, a folk influence into what you're doing or a, an EDM kind of style uh, beat in, in, a, in a rock tune or whatever it is, you've kind of got those instincts as well, not just what you're working on. Um, and I think, okay, I said two, but I'm going to go for three. The final thing is actually... Steely Dan. <laughs> no. I mean, there's nothing wrong with Steve Dan, but uh, streaming services, um, love them or hate them, one of the things that's cool about them is this loudness normalization thing where they even the, the levels out. It's not perfect, but it means that you're going to be less um, kind of misled by the differences in loudness. You know, if you are if you just put on one CD and then another CD, and then I know CDs are the round silver things. Um the levels will go up and down. You can adjust the volume control, but even so, whereas if you just put a, a kind of a playlist on, just listen to, I don't know, current top 100 in whatever genre you like, whatever it is, that's going to, over time, that's just kind of sort of filter into your subconscious um, in a way that is super, super useful. Um, so, yeah. Can I can I have an aside? Because um, no. Robin Hood, yeah. by the way, I didn't, I didn't know Robin Hood was a musician, so welcome, Robin. Um, the is asking like maybe we should master on a cell phone or on you know something crappy because the majority of people are listening in crappy environments can you speak to that i know you've you've done some really cool stuff about that i'd love to get capture some of that wisdom here yeah um the i understand the logic of that and mm -hmm. it, it does seem to make sense and i definitely think there's some value in referencing you know our music on on, on something like this as as terrible as they sound um but for me, mastering needs to be on the highest quality system we can figure out. Um, and there's kind of a few different reasons for it. The One of them is that you can't fix what you can't hear. And also you can not hear things that are you're distracted from by other things. So just for example, most mobile phone speakers have no bass. So there could be an enormous sub bass that you're just completely unaware of. So you can't adjust that level of bass accurately um, without being able to hear it. They also usually have much more distortion than any other um, type of speaker. In fact, the latest iPhones have extra processing them in them to make the tiny crappy little speakers sound better. But they do that by adding harmonics. It's almost like that plug in um, the old waves one something i forgot the name of it. max bass thank you yeah. um it would add higher harmonics to give you an impression of extra sub bass in there even on smaller speakers and these things do the same thing so it's i mean there's distortion in the sense that the speaker can't handle it and then there's extra processing and it, it just it all gets in the way of what you, what you need is the most accurate clinical version of what you're working on that you can mm -hmm. and what i found you know one of the big things about mastering is translation which sorry, by the way, doesn't mean making things sound the same on every system. It means making right. them sound right on every system. So when somebody listens on a pair of these or on a pair of Beats headphones or in a in a car with a massive subwoofer bass bin at the back, it sounds super bassy or super tinny or whatever it is, but exactly the way that people expect it to, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you have a monitoring system with no bass and you pile way too much bass in when it gets played on a pair of beats or in the car with the huge bass bins, it'll just sound absurd um, mm -hmm. and possibly destroy the car. Um, whereas <laughs> if your system is complete or as flat as possible and you get the amount of bass just right, um, then in that environment, it'll sound super bassy on the earbuds. It'll sound super tinny. Um, so yeah, you need to be able to hear stuff. And, and there's a great analogy. I, I put up a blog post a long time ago because uh, I'm a huge Peter Gabriel fan. Mm -hmm. And they re-released one of his concerts in, I think it was Blu-ray, so it would have been HD at this point. Mm -hmm. not, for, not, I think it probably will come out in 4K eventually. But And I had the DVD, and I looked at this comparison online of the picture quality from the two, and I was like, well, the DVD's better. That looks brighter and, and kind mm -hmm. of it pops more, and the, the, the Blu-ray looks a bit soft. And then I thought, okay, but I'm looking at them in a YouTube window, and this wasn't even, mm -hmm. probably wasn't even 720 YouTube. You know, this was long enough ago that it was really low res. So I remember clicking the HD button on YouTube for the first time ever. And I, I think it had to like take two minutes to kind of think about it before it could even start to feed me video because there was just so much data right. coming in that it wasn't right. used to. But when I had full screen HD 
suddenly I was like, oh, there's all kinds of horrible artifacts and kind of edging and noise and grain and distortion in that DVD picture. Yeah, it's it's more saturated because actually the colors are blown out. It's overcooked, mm -hmm. you know? And now I could see the beauty of the Blu-ray um, image. And that's the same with audio. It's like if you have a, if, if you're, listening system is not high enough res to hear all of the details and see all of the nuance. The risk is that you will overdo it, overcook it, pile in a load of stuff that you don't notice. And then when it gets played on a really high quality system, um, that stuff will be kind of overwhelmingly bad. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, That's so good. I was hoping you talk about the Peter Gabriel thing because I remember, because I think you posted the two thumbnails and like here, yeah, I would almost have picked the lower res, but then when you blow it up, it's so obvious that the HD one is better. So that idea of mastering to the, not the lowest common denominator, but the highest one, and it'll still work on the low. Anyway, fantastic. Yep. All right. That was a good, that was a good aside. Um, both of us get a point for that. Okay. Whose turn is it now? Is it yours? Um, yeah, no, I just yours. did, uh, wait, I did level EQ and compression. What did you, what was your second one? I did listen to good stuff. In your studio. That's it. So it's my turn again. So it's, mine was it's my listen to Steely Dan. <laughs> Every speaker demo I did when I worked for a company that like promoted QSC speakers, it was always Steely Dan. So Steely Dan or Dark Side of the Moon, right? Right. Yep. Um, even though Wish You Were Here actually sounds a bit better in my opinion. <gasps> Sacrilege. All right. Um, All right. Okay. So my final point actually kind of relates back to both of my previous ones because I'm clever that way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or pretentious, depending on how you want to think about it. Um, so it's avoid static mixes. Okay. Um, by which I mean, you need to think about every moment of the song. So, you know, I talked about the importance of automation. Um, for me, a mix is not done until I, until there is a reason that every bar sounds the way that it does. Mm. So if I take it back and go for the opposite, the temptation, especially when we don't have a mixing desk to kind of tempt us to, to, to move the faders is, you, you know, you record all the best parts you can. Um, you, uh, all, you know, you, you've got your fantastic strumming guitar part all the way through and this amazing keyboard pad and all, all the rest of it. And you, you balance them up and they sound great and you let it play and you think, yeah, that sounds great. Um, that's a good starting point, but that's the way to create a linear dull mix, right? What you really, in my opinion, want to be doing is, listening to it and when you know two bars in it's like okay well i've heard that guitar intro that that cool kind of strumming that pattern that we've got going now let's do something else right so the guitar drops back slightly and you notice a little bit more of the keyboard pad or you start noticing the brushes on the drums or whatever it is um for me you want to have a little bit of interest all the way through even when even if, if it just feels like the band is just riffing um mm -hmm. so that j it just kind of helps keep um, keeps our ear interested. When things are just the same, it's so easy to kind of tune out. Um, and I mean, the classic example would be when the vocal comes in. It's like maybe the arrangement gets more sparse anyway, but mm -hmm. if it doesn't, you can bring everything else back and just lift the vocal out a little bit. Um, and then, I mean, thinking about vocals and going back to the whole thing about levels and automation, ride the vocal fader to get consistent or use clip gain or automation curves or however you want right. to do it to get a really consistent vocal, or not even necessarily consistent, but just a really musically pleasing vocal so that it's quiet when it wants to be quiet. It's loud when, you know, if there's a word that gets lost, rather than just reaching straight for the compressor, bring that word up. So that, mm -hmm. And then you can add compression later if you want to use mm -hmm. it for tone or for shaping the, the, the sound or whatever it might be. Um, but yeah, my goal is, you know, so, like if you kind of came in and were like, okay, and tell me about your mix, what's, why is nothing happening there? And I'm like, because it's absolutely perfect. And actually, because this guy, they, I, you know, I yeah. I shouldn't be going, well, oh yeah, I didn't think of that. You know, mm -hmm. and if I am, then maybe I've dropped the ball. At that point, I can think about it. And if I decide, well, it's good the way it is, well, that's good. But yeah, I want to know that I've thought about every single moment of, of the song. Yeah. And, and you're coming at it from a mixing standpoint, but obviously from a production standpoint, there's that, did you see the interview with Sting from uh, Rick Beato? Where right at the beginning he says, "Surprise me every," I forget how often it was. Not, it was like four or eight bars. Like it was, he was <laughs> demanding. Um, but I love that idea from a production standpoint. And then I go and overproduce everything. So I'm like, Sting said to. But um, but from a mixing standpoint, I think the idea someone was asking, "What does static mix means?" Good question. Static mix is where you're setting levels and panning, kind of like we talked about earlier. 
but ideally it doesn't stay there and things, the mix can move and breathe and things come in and come out. So the idea of, you know, uh, 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 what's his name? Hey Joe, where are you going with that gun in your hand? Uh, Jimi Hendrix and the, all the people gathered around the console, they didn't have automation on the fader. So they had to like play the mix. Like, okay, here's that part, push it up and push it back down. They would mark things with tape to know where to move the fader. We don't have to do that. We have the luxury of digital stuff, but I will raise my hand and say, I am lazy when it comes to automation because it's like a whole nother mix. Like I got the mix sounding good, but a lot of the, when you see like big name mix engineers, a lot of what they spend their time doing is this riding faders, pushing things up and down. I remember uh, Graham Cochran talking about, he went to a mix of the masters thing with Shakir King. And he said there was a whole, when he went to automate, it was this intense thing where like, he was like, like leaning over the board, sweat dripping down his face. Cause he's like riding all these faders to get this song. Right. And it, it, that left an impact on me of, yeah, this I'm a part of the band. I'm playing the mix. It makes sense that it would need to move. Not crazy, but once you, the, the other thing is once you start doing it, you realize, well, now I have to do that now now that the strings come in and out now i need that bass to, to do its thing um so you can certainly go too far but it really is when i have the discipline to make sure i do that i'm always glad i did because the mix starts to feel like it feels alive versus like static and just kind of feels less like a board mix and more like a real like thing a real production that's yeah good. absolutely that's, that's two fact, points for ian i can i can think of an example of that actually i um I'm sure he wouldn't mind me saying this. I, my friend Dan Ecclestone, who's a really talented musician, his first, he, he formed a band, but he recorded the, his first album all himself. Mm -hmm. um, and I mixed it for him. And it was kind of a challenge because for us to begin with, I had to denoise the vocals because he recorded them in the attic of his house and he didn't realize the hot water pipes were hissing in the background. So there was this crap. <laughs> anyway, um, but the other thing that happened was that he was uh, a music teacher, was his, was his day job. Um, and he... So he got a, a friend to play the drum parts for him. And I forget, I don't know whether the guy played, I think maybe the guy played the drum parts first and then Dan edited them in Cubase to, to kind of build the song structure and then he laid everything else on top of it. Mm -hmm. But the reason I thought think this is a cool little story is that, that it, it covers two of the tips we've given here um, because A, he didn't get the drummer to play loud enough. Right, the drummer was just you know in a, it was all there. It was all rhythmic. The fills, everything was, was there. It was all good, but he just wasn't playing the kit aggressively enough. So Dan always wanted the drums to sound louder. So we ended up putting distortion on the drums and just kind of <laughs> all, over compression, all kinds of stuff, just to get kind of more energy in there for him. Um, but it was never quite as good as if you know. I mean, he la they later went on to play live, and he was like, oh, just I, I just wish the album could sound like we do live because. Mm -hmm. The, the drums are there so that's but the other thing that i ended up doing was automating or actually clip gaining the hell out of those drums um to to just add contrast so somebody was asking what do you do when there isn't enough contrast in or you asked me in, in in the mastering stage and you can manipulate either with automation or with changing uh, different settings on the processing whatever it is to add dynamics in and i was doing it at the mix stage and just literally i'd be going in and like doing individual sh um, snare hits for example just to mm -hmm. or little bits of fills just to to pep it up um and that's kind of just a sort of fairly extreme example of the kind of thing that we're we're talking about but um and then the other thing of course bonus tip um is you can always as a mixer it depends on the client but sometimes it's okay for us to actually affect the arrangement by literally taking something out completely, you know? Mm -hmm. So rather than mm -hmm. having that static mix where everything plays all the way through, it's just say, you know what? I'm going to drop out everything except the acoustic guitar and the drums at this mm -hmm. point. And then I'm going to bring, you know, that kind of stuff can also help. Um, and is another example of just thinking about every, keep, keeping that variety. Yeah. Surprising people every four bars or eight bars or whatever it is. Yeah. I love that. Somebody, uh, Casey said doing live sound said, I'm always playing the band. I remember sitting behind, there's a venue here in Nashville. I think it closed down called the Rutledge. Pretty small venue, but I remember sitting behind the sound guy for one show, and he was working as hard as anybody. It, well, he wasn't just kind of leaning back and like maybe touching the vocal, but like he was, he was. It, what I liked the most is all of his effects were coming in on it's their own set of channels, so reverb and delay, and he would be fading those in like between vocal phrases, like in a live show. Like he didn't have to do that. The artists certainly didn't even hear it because they're on stage, but it made for such an engaging. You'd have this big immersive reverb, and then when she'd start speaking between songs, he'd pull it back, of course. Just but even in the middle of songs, he was playing the mix, and I I loved that so much. 
yeah, it's something that's always impressed me about live sound engineers is like, you know, you'll you'll have guys, I don't know, setting up kind of um, delays on vocals and stuff, you know, and tapping out the tempo to kind of when they're setting up and then blending. Yeah, I mean, to, to do that live is a whole other level of, mm-hmm. of skill. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's very cool. That'd be scary. All right, here's my final mastering tip. And then we've got a surprise for you after. Surprises. Um, okay, so this one, we could talk for the next eight hours on this one. Um, but we're not. So just as a kind of a introductory thing to the idea, you got to understand how the whole loudness penalty thing works. That's the final mastering tip. Understand what happens, A, when you master your stuff too loud, what it does to the sound, because it's bad, and then B, what happens when you submit that loud master to the different streaming services, Uh, because they will, each of them is a little different, uh, but they will, if it's too loud they will turn it down in an attempt to if i throw eight artists into a playlist ideally i should be able to listen all the way through without having to constantly adjust my volume so the good news is this has made it all the way into the big streaming platforms because they realize that stupid loud isn't really helping anybody um but what that means is if you're too loud they'll turn you down but also i think the piece that we don't talk about enough is if you're too quiet like if you're too scared to push the volume even to like a reasonable level, they can't turn you up, right? If your dynamic range is like 20 dB, they, they, they're they going to bump up into the ceiling before they ever get you up to like, like if they're aiming for what Spotify, minus 14 luffs. If your final master is minus 20 and your peak is at like minus one, they got nowhere to go, right? They're not going to remaster your music for you and bring the dynamics down so they can turn the whole thing up. Um, so that's the piece that I think, I think Ian, you've done such a good job over the years of scaring us about the loudness wars in a good way. Like there's no reason to go so loud. It can sound amazing and better, not slammed within an inch of its life. But I know for me, that sometimes makes me too timid to say, I don't want, I don't want Ian to not like my master. And so they end up occasionally coming out too quiet, um, which at the end of the day, it's okay. If it sounds good, it sounds good. But I think that's a piece of understanding that just feels mysterious. Even for me up until like the last few years, I still was like, I'm not entirely sure what Spotify is doing. I know they're doing something. Um, and Ian invented uh, a tool called the loudness penalty, uh, which is a plugin. And now just what this week is a standalone. So you can bring your tracks into it and it has this cool visualization that shows you visually what's happening to the mixes as Spotify, for example, levels them out. Um, but super helpful, um, to understand what that's doing, because if you don't understand it, then you'll, you'll either go too far in one direction or the other versus a nice happy medium. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for the, for the plug. Um, the, the new app's called Loudness Penalty Studio for anybody who, mm-hmm. who wants to see it. And I don't know if people are interested, we could maybe bring it up during the, the Q and A at the end, sure. but, um, the, yeah, I, I'm going to just add to that slightly. I've actually caught a lot of flack for the name Loudness Penalty. So interesting. The idea for the site was I was, you know, I've been talking about this since forever and I would mm-hmm. literally get five to 10 emails or messages a day from people telling asking me what's going to happen when I upload my music to, or why does this happen to my music when I, upload? and I, um, I was chatting to Chris Graham, who's also a mastering engineer, um, mm-hmm. over in the U S and, uh, and he was saying, you know, it'd be great if there was a website, we could just go and it would just tell you what was going to happen. And I was like, well, I could do that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so I talked to Ian Kerr. There's two Ians in this in this thing at Meter Plugs, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and we decided we would do that. Um, so we made the site that just you ju- in the browser. You don't upload anything. You just drag your file on, and it calculates what will happen to to the level. And the name loudness penalty was floating around there somewhere, um, and we talked a lot about whether we should call it that or not. And we said, yeah, let's do it. Cause it's, cause it's provocative, right? It's, it catches people's attention. Cause from my perspective, not enough people were aware of what was going on or understand how it works. So anything that kind of spread the word was going to be a good thing. And it worked. I mean, boy, did it work? It's like, <laughs> you know, we had no idea. I mean, it, I literally, I hear people using the phrase in conversations and they're not talking about the website, you know, they're just mm-hmm. talking about what happens, which is kind of great, but also not so great because I mean, you mentioned about people being scared. That is a thing. Mm-hmm. So literally today I saw on Reddit a post from somebody is a whole rant about how you don't have to aim at loudness targets, which I agree with, and you can you should feel free to master your music however you like, whatever loudness feels right to you, which I agree with. Um, and then it said something about the 
he, he wasn't even going to put the website address in there because it was banned in this in this forum or this, this Reddit <laughs> subgroup. Um, and he thankfully he said that I was what did he say? Um, well-meaning, I think, or amiable. He, he used, <laughs> used to describe me, but he, and he said it had completely backfired. Um, and because I was preparing for this, I haven't written. I need to write a reply and just say, you know, thanks so much for the for the great post. I agree with most of what you said, but I genuinely don't think it backfired. I, what I want to say is, there's a very long way of getting around to saying the loudness penalty is not about the numbers, right? If your song is turned down by six dB or eight dB or whatever, and it sounds great to you, fantastic. There is no penalty, right? It's not a penalty if it still sounds good, but. What I see all the time is people going, I thought my song sounded amazing. And then I uploaded it and listened to it next to such and such. And it didn't sound good, right? And that's because the key point, the whole idea of the loudness penalty is if you know that your song is going to be turned down by four dBs, say, and you compare it with uh, Steely Dan, <laughs> that's not being turned down at all. <laughs> right. But you right. also compare it to Skrillex, who's being turned down by nine dBs. I mean, mm -hmm. that would be insane because nobody's going to compare themselves to both Steely Dan and Skrillex except me. Wow. Um, but the question is, how do those three things sound when they're all being listened to as close to minus 14 as they will go, right? Because mm -hmm. you're right, they don't typically get turned up. Um, loud stuff gets turned down pretty much everywhere. And that's the thing, is listening in context. It's, okay, if my song was in a playlist with my other three favorite reference tracks, and um, I've adjusted all the levels and I'm listening to them all at minus 14, then how do they sound? And if your song still sounds great, you're fine. If not, you've got an opportunity to fix it, right? It's knowledge is, is power. Rather than uploading it and then being disappointed, you can kind of go think about it and think, well, why? Okay, now that I hear them like that, mine seems to have a little bit less bass or mm -hmm. maybe, you know, it's a little bit scooped in the mids or whatever it might, or maybe it needs more density, it needs more saturation. You can hear all of those differences so much more clearly when things are matched in loudness. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just a super powerful strategy. Um, mm -hmm. And and yeah, the, the key thing is for people to, if you want to master your stuff really, really loud, do that. Mm -hmm. um, but I know there are lots of people who don't particularly want to do that, but feel like they need to, because otherwise it's not going to sound right or it's not, people are not going to like it or it's not going to, you know, and none of that stuff applies. If you, providing you check by, and you don't even have to use the, I mean, the Landers Penalty website is free, so it's sure. a really easy way to do it. But you can just use any LUFS meter. You know, you just have to measure the song from beginning to end. It gives you the integrated value. It's the overall thing. Mm -hmm. And then you look at it and you go, okay, mine's minus 10. Spotify is minus 14. So they're going to turn it down by four. Here's my other reference track. That's going to get turned down by three. So I'll do that and I'll listen to them next to each other. Um, and you can make the comparison. Uh, and that's the value is when you hear it in that way, you just get this extra insight um, into how it sounds and what you might want to do. And one one exercise you can do whenever is if get a track, get a mix that you're proud of, and then master it at three, two or three different volumes. So one that's reasonable, ones that's stupid loud, and then pull those masters into a, a clean session. And then once you've measured the loudness, compensate for that so they're all playing at roughly the same average level. And pay attention to what okay, if the volume isn't the difference now, what is the difference? And you'll notice, um, even on the page for, I was watching the video earlier for the Loudness Penalty Studio, there was a section where you were talking about the, a band where they had sent you something that was a little too loud and then not too loud. Once you level matched them, you could hear the punchiness on the one with a little more dynamic than on the one that was cooked pretty hard. Um, and that, to me, you've done one, uh, there was one on Michael Jackson, the, the remasters of, it was Beat It or something like that. And the louder it got, once you level matched them, it sounded worse each time. And the older dynamic one sounded so the kick drum just like, you know, gave you a big hug like you want it to versus this squashed kind of within an inch of its life sort of thing. So, um, yeah, you were going to say something. I sensed it. I, no, I was just going to say you're absolutely right. The, the, uh, I was thinking that when I was thinking I'm getting ahead of myself when I was talking about <laughs> that whole thing of, of different, you know, you were saying what do people do? And I was like, well, mm -hmm. they tend to overcook the mix bus compression. So, yeah, if anybody wants to actually see an example of that in action, if you head over to meterplugs.com forward slash loudness dash penalty dash studio um or because we have it's so new we don't even have it on the front page yet or you can go to the menu at the top and it's it's in that drop down menu um uh, you can take you can take a look um and i'm planning to do some more videos um in the, if you in can the coming switch, weeks if you can turn on my my screen i'll show it um oh, yeah, i got okay. it pulled up um if if okay. nothing else just watching this video and watching just what happens the visualization or even this this 
animated GIF right here. It's showing how tall it is, is how dynamic it is, and then it's matching all the average volumes. And you can just anyway, it's to me, it's just such an educational thing to watch. And then this right here, <laughs> right there's my favorite. Um, I want except those for it should go up to eleven, but uh, it's yeah. you know what you can't win them all. It's fine. <laughs> So what I would love to do is if you have questions, I know you guys have, you all have been posting. I just said guys. I hate it when YouTubers say guys. Y'all have posted questions in the chat. We've probably missed most of them. If you have a question you'd like us to answer, please drop it in the chat now and we'll uh, spend some time doing, yeah, we should drop a link. Um, Ian, maybe you can drop a link in the chat. Uh, we'll spend some time um, answering some questions. And while you're getting your question in, uh, I want to talk about something new from Ian and myself. So we've been friends for 15 years. We've we've talked about each other's programs, we've promoted each other, we've done things together, but we've never actually done like a a course together where like we combine ourselves, like, give me five right here. Right here, right. Let me go. Closer. Oh no, I'm sorry. Um, no, that, um, that way. Yeah. See? Bam. With our <laughs> powers combined. So Ian and I have created uh, a punchy course that anybody can jump in. And we'll go through the mastering process and the mixing process and the mastering process on a song um, together. So I'll I'll contribute all the mixing material. Ian will contribute all the mastering material uh, and we'll do it all in a live environment, much like what we're doing right now. Um, it's going to be really fun. And one of the cool things somebody earlier said it'd be great in the chat. I lost the chat, but someone said it would be great if y'all could demonstrate how to take a normal home studio production and what you would do mixing and mastering wise to make it sound professional. So, of course, I can't go a live stream without saying get it right the source. That's a big piece of it. But once you get it right the source, there's a handful of other things you got to do, right? We, we got to get that sucker to the finish line. And that's where mixing and mastering comes in. Um, and so the song that we've chosen for this is a song, first of all, that you haven't heard. It's not a Joe Gilder song, which is just a nice change of pace. It's a Steely Dan tune. No, I'm kidding. It's not Steely Dan. Um, it is a, a friend of mine. Uh, his name's Dave. And he has a phenomenal voice and he's got such a good vibe, but he's also real new to like music production. So like he, this track is all done in his home studio. There are uh, there are bits in there and, and things that we're going to look at that maybe say, hey, maybe we can polish this up here. Um, so there's, it's not perfect by any means, but it's such a good vibe. Um, so that's the song we're going to be using for this program. Um, and so it'll be a live stream where uh, actually, actually a week from today, I'll be mixing the song live right here. Um, and then the following week, Ian will take my master and he will be going through his mastering process. So if you wanted to watch us do our thing from start to finish on the same song that you also have the tracks to, you'll get my mix. So you can practice your mastering or you can just sit back and watch how the whole thing goes and then try your hand at it afterwards. I prefer the sandwich approach where you go try to mix like you sign up today, you work on your mix this week, then you come watch how I mixed it. Then you go back and work on your mix again. So I'm the like the meat of the sandwich. And then on the mastering, Ian's the meat in the side. This got weird, but um, <laughs> this is, I love making Ian uncomfortable. It's one of my favorite things. Um, it's just glorious. So um, Ian, if you can switch back to my screen, if y'all want to check this out, um, you have a week to sign up for it um, and it's over. We're calling it Across the Pond because why Oops. not? You're in the um, wrong tab. Right there we go. It's called Across the Pond Mixing and Mastering Live. And to get there, just go to homestudiocorner.com slash ATP stands for across the pond hyphen live. And I will try to drop that in the chat as well, unless Ian is already way ahead of me. Um, there's a little I'm, video I'm, there explaining pretty much what I just explained to you. Um, there's a couple of questions down there, but the doors close in about six days, eight hours and zero minutes. So we're kicking this thing off a week from now. So if you're interested and want to learn more from us, uh, y'all should come check that out. Will you have a sale for HSC anniversary? This is it. This is the sale. Um, it's something brand new and it's going to be super fun. And we've made it very affordable because we want to just give everybody a chance to come in and have fun and play with us. All right. So we're going to leave that on the screen and jump into questions. Um, Ian, did you, were you able to get a link in there? Is that what you're? Yeah, I, I typed it on. I'm just checking it works. That works. So I will Sweet. paste it momentarily. Awesome. Link is coming. Let's see. Question wise. Um, I missed all the questions. There we go. Um, what would be a bare bones chain to start with to getting a better feel without overcomplicating it, meaning a uh, mastering chain? I mean, Ian's better better equipped to answer this, but sometimes for me, it's a limiter and maybe an EQ. And some, some days that's all it needs. 
Yeah, I would, I would totally agree with that. Um, I <laughs> that's a bonus point for you. I think you win. Basically, I think we're tied. We're tied um, now. It's <laughs> the um, yeah, I so so we both are big fans of minimalism. I mean, this is another reason why it's so cool that we're finally teaming up, and so ridiculous that we haven't. Because the reason I shared I that video of Joe's back in the day was just. I was like, this post needs a video just to, so that people can see what I'm talking about. And I don't have the, at that point, I didn't have a YouTube channel, so I didn't have any way to make it. And I was just, huh. and I started searching and I saw Joe's video and it's like, there you go. That's what I would say if it was me. So I can just, so I emailed him to ask if I could borrow it. And it's been the same all the way through. I, he mm-hmm. keeps posting videos that I just agree. With. It's like, yes, there you go. Exactly. Do that. Um, so yeah, th- that's, um, and minimalism is one of the things that we agree on both in mixing and in mastering. Mm-hmm. So I always have a limiter sitting there in the, on the stereo output just to avoid clipping. Um, it may not be doing anything for quite a bit of the time, but it's always there just to, to kind of keep the peaks under control. But then, yeah, the first thing that I do in any mastering process is just to, to increase the level. So just like mixing, my tip was get the levels right. It's the same in mastering. Bring the level up so that you know, when you've figured out what your monitoring level is going to be, you've got one for mixing, you've got one for mastering, so that it sounds good, impressive, but not uncomfortably loud with your setting there and you're getting the readings you want on the meter. Um, and it's minimalist in terms of processing, because if it sounds great, that's all you need, but also in terms of the workflow, because Joe mentioned briefly that whole, the whole Fletcher Munson thing, the smile curve of we hear different frequencies differently depending on how loud stuff is. So if you EQ something at low volume and then lift it up, you will hear more bass when you lift it up than you did when it was at low volume. So Mm -hmm. what sounded right to you at low volume will suddenly possibly not sound right at higher volume. So for me, step one, get the level up there. Then you can start working on the EQ. Then you can start thinking about the dynamics if, if you want. Um, But yeah, I mean, another, I mean, I'm doing a, a lecture in a college tomorrow. Um, and Ooh. actually, this, this, yeah, I know. Get me fancy. <laughs> um, the Leeds Conservatoire, don't you know? <laughs> um, but but uh, actually, they call it the Leeds Conservatory because I think conservatoire sounds too uh, too fancy. No. But um, the uh, in previous at this time, they want me to talk about AI. So yeah, I'm talking about AI. Actually, no, it's going to be really interesting, and I will do a video of it for you guys in the future so you can see what I think of it. But. In previous years, I've done a demo at the end where I get the students to give me uh, two or three songs on USB, and I will just master it there in the lecture. So you know, it's it's typically on a set of Genlex, and I'm working in Logic, um, and all I use is a limiter and an EQ. And mm-hmm. the the difference you can make by getting the le- level and the EQ balanced, with no compression, and the limiter is just literally preventing the you know nothing heavy, uh, is amazing. So that's the kind of minimalist setup, and then you might want to add in some compression to that. And then there's all the other stuff like saturation and stereo widening and parallel compression, all those kind of things. That you but but they're like ten percent. You know, they're mm-hmm. they're the icing on the cake. The mm-hmm. the just like with mixing, um, EQ compression and limiting are the the kind of the core of a, of a minimalist chain. So yeah, there's lots of stuff that I master that only has three actual processing plugins in it um, or pieces of gear. Mm-hmm. And you got to get over the oh, I sh- it shouldn't look that way. Just. Yeah, just because everybody else is showing you seven and eight plugins in a chain, you know. Uh, yeah, so I, I mean, I have a preset that I call up that has mm-hmm. a bunch of stuff that I use all the time, but everything mm-hmm. is disabled um, to begin with, you know, and it's just, oh, okay, I need that, so I'll enable it, and then I'll move on to the next thing. David Chapman asks, do you master always true peak to minus one for the conversion online? I do. I do. Sick. <laughs> um, Great. The... Yeah, I mean, it's it's a slightly controversial one because the originally True Peak limiters were to prevent problems at the converter, right? So mm-hmm. the the issue is that the samples your samples are not always going to be at the top of the waveform, right? If you've got a, a waveform that goes like this, you might have one sample here, one sample there, but the top of the waveform goes like that. So all audio contains intersample peaks; they're just peaks mm-hmm. that just happen to happen in between the samples because of the magic of the sampling theorem, they are in there somewhere, but you just don't see them when you look at the sample values. So when mm-hmm. we look at a traditional peak meter, it might say zero, but actually the the analog waveform that it represents could go above zero. So those, those are the intersample peaks. 
um, back in the day, somebody clever at TC Electronics figured out that that could cause problems with some um, CD players and some um, DACs, um, different bits of audio gear that mm-hmm. don't have enough headroom. So they introduced the, the TruePeak metering and TruePeak limiting and all the rest of it. A bigger concern for me, though, these days is uh, what you would call peak overshoot um, that can happen because, of, for example, something silly like putting sample rate conversion on or a low-cut filter um, that maybe they don't do anything that you can really hear that much. You know, Maybe mm-hmm. it's just taking out some really low subs that don't really register on your speakers. But little processes like that can affect the peak levels and suddenly you've got overshoot. And one of the worst culprits is when it gets encoded for MP3 or AAC or the streaming platforms. Mm-hmm. Um, that stuff can introduce overshoots that um, can potentially cause problems further down the chain. So for all of those reasons, I recommend minus one. It's not bulletproof, right? If, you, if you're if you mastering at healthy loudness and you've got your peak, even with your peaks at minus one on a kind of a 96 kilobits per second or even worse mobile phone connection, mm-hmm there's still going to be overshoot, peak overshoot, because of that um, that data compression that's happening. Um, but to be honest, once it gets that low, it, in right. some ways that's the least of your problems. Yeah. You know, it's, it's sucked all the stereo image out and it's kind of, it's mulchy and it's swirly and all the rest of it. So I don't worry too much about that. In my experience, with the kind of mastering loudness that I suggest, um, minus one is a really good place to be. Um, just as just to kind of keep yourself safe and people say do you do that for cd as well and i say yes i do it for cd as well because who actually listens to cds i don't i mean i have cds I mean, I, <laughs> right here's, here's the new peter gabriel album sitting but i ripped it right it's it's right. on my it's on my phone that's how i listen to it um and so the same risk is is there um so yeah for me it just it's easy to just kind of just do do that for everything do you have when you when you set up your studio, did you calibrate to a certain SPL volume for your kind of standard listening? And if so, what is that? Or do you have a guess as to what your your go to? Well, I haven't answered that, but I've answered all the questions yet. How about you, Joe? I I did this with an SPL meter, blah blah blah, years ago, and I found I really enjoy the volume at like sixty nine to seventy dB. I hear some people say mixing at eighty five, that would I would die. Um, that's so loud. I could do that for about five minutes um so yeah for me it's like the super low 70s feels comfortable i feel like i can have a conversation i can i can listen to it all day without getting a lot of ear fatigue so that's that's going to be my answer um also the question a couple people asking if there will be a re- replay this is it so you just this you just rewind no, this, this is, video this is the live the live but if you come <laughs> back later this will be the replay right, right it's both right. wait it's, it's quantum both. it's schrodinger's replay um look at us with our smart jokes um so yeah it, it so to me it was it was the decibel level doesn't matter as much as just being consistent with it and it turned out i like it i like it lower yeah i i i used to know this i mean i did initially to set it up to get it in the right ballpark um but this is something that i was going to say back in the question about um you know learning how things sound in your room um, um i just forgot to mention it so when i first set this room up i was super lucky because i've got my back catalog right so mm-hmm. there's all that stuff that i've mastered in the big mastering room. i know exactly how it's supposed to sound so that really helped me figure out whether this room was going to be good enough or not whether it was working or not um and, and thankfully it was but yeah i just listened to a ton of stuff um i i mean <laughs> If I, I'm pretty sure I have mine calibrated with pink noise at minus 11 LUFS measures 80 dB C weighted, dB SPL C weighted, I think. There it is. But then you've, got to, then you've got to convert that because normally you have it at minus 14. So that would take it down by three. So that would be like 76, 77, right? Which is kind of similar to yours. So yeah, definitely not 85. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, maybe for mixing, but no way in. For, for, for mastering. Um, but the, my real answer is, it's, it's kind of, it's a, it's a multi-stage process. You need to decide how loud you're going to master. So you either pick your favorite reference stuff and I say, I'm going to master as loud as that, which is likely going to be really difficult 
because mm-hmm. it's hard to get great results mastering super loud. Or you say you follow my advice and you turn it down so that the loudest sections measure about minus 10 LUFS or around about zero on that VU meter that's calibrated at minus 11, right? Um, not using the integrated values because, well, for reasons. Um, find the loudest <laughs> section. Look at the short-term loudness on an LUFS meter. Most DAWs have them in now. Have it hovering around about minus 10. Do that for all of them and then start listening. And then just adjust the, the your monitoring level so that it sounds fantastic but not too loud. Mm-hmm. Make a little mark on the on the, the monitor control, wherever it is you're controlling the gain, and that can be your mastering level. But also then be open-minded. It's not like you're going to get it right necessarily first time. Start working with it. And what you might find is either you'll be constantly tempted to push the the levels up, in which case it's probably a little bit low, or mm-hmm. you'll start to just, you know, want to keep clearing your ear out and or your your ears might even worse start to sound, start to ring or whatever yeah that's a clue that it's just a little bit too loud so you just notch it back a little bit and you might have to you know you'll you'll play with it it might vary but over a few days or a week or so you'll figure out what mm-hmm. is just perfect for you because it's so personal um yeah. so yeah i mean those kind of numbers 75 ish i think is, is is a good place to be or but but there's there's an example, right? It sounds like I'm kind of 76, 77, and you're more like down in the seventies. So mm-hmm. that, that's an mm-hmm. example of how it, it all depends on on your your personal taste and the room you're in and the kind of music mm-hmm. you're working on, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, good. That's good. Do you use a clipper? Do you ever use a clipper? And if so, when? Yes. Um, I don't know what that is. Okay. Uh, so a limiter is a compressor with a super fast attack and release time. Yes. Um, so the signal goes up, it detects that it's going up, and it pulls it back, and it holds it back for a minute, and then it lets it go. Mm-hmm. And if you're using it the way it's intended to be used, on the transients mainly, super, super fast stuff, you probably won't hear it, and it'll sound really clean, and it's probably the best way of controlling the level. Okay. For me, that's how I start, typically. Um, there's a caveat to that, which I'll come back to in a second. But yeah, my favorite limiter is made by TC Electronic, um, and it allows you to dial in the clipping separately from the pure limiting. So I start with a pure mm. limiter. Um, sometimes, if it's the, the thing I'm working on has been recorded really clean, but it's meant to sound loud, I get the, something similar to what I was just talking about, where it's like the, the meters say the level is right, and it kind of, but I, I, I want more. Right, mm-hmm. and I, I push it up, and I think, well, no, now it's too loud. The meters are reading too loud, and I'm seeing the limiter working too hard. I don't want to limit it that hard, and that's when I might bring in the clipper, because instead of that whole compression thing, it just, well, there's there's hard clipping and there's soft clipping, and I prefer soft clipping. Hard clipping, I think, is best left alone, but soft clipping will just instead of having an attack and release time with the rest, of it, it just rounds those peaks off. Right, mm-hmm. so a hard clipper will just slice them straight off, so you'll literally see a flat top to the waveform, um, which is generally, and that's not something that I'm a fan of. But a soft clipper will do it more like an analog desk or tape might have done it. It'll just round those peaks off. The upside is you don't get the the ducking, you don't get the the softening of the peaks that you can mm-hmm. get from limiting. The downside is instead you get distortion, mm-hmm. but if you balance it right, it's kind of quite cool distortion that actually almost seems to preserve a little bit of the impact of those transients. So if I'm pushing the level up and I want more impact, I might experiment with a little bit of clipping to get a more aggressive sound. You don't want to go do it because it'll start to distort and be unpleasant. And maybe you do want that as a creative thing, but usually in mastering, that's not what I feel is appropriate. Um, But yeah, it can give you kind of a bit more of an energetic kind of... uh, aggressive feel um Mm -hmm. and you share the load that i i typically i wouldn't use 100 percent one 100 percent the other i'd share the load between the so like you know if the limiter was pushing into four dbs of gain reduction bring the limit uh, the clipper in um just to hold back the top couple of dbs so then you just got one or two dbs of limiting which i kind of feel more comfortable with um and you can keep the loudness the same so that's that's how i use it um it's i'm planning a youtube video saying so called something like clipping is not the answer you're looking for because what I'm seeing right now is just like last year it was parallel compression this year it's like everybody's talking about clipping um and it's like 
it's cool sometimes in moderation, but it's so easy to overdo it and just mm-hmm. kind of destroy things. I, it's one of, the, yeah. Apologies to everybody who knows. It's one of those Spider-Man processes, right? With great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> um, you gotta be careful. All right, we got another question here. But first, um, just so you know, if you're just joining us, Ian and I are partnering up to do this number right here. Go to this website. It should be uh, there. Should be in the description. There's also a comment as well. Homestudiocorner.com slash ATP hyphen live across the pond. Uh, if you want to learn mixing and mastering from both of us over the next couple of weeks, it's going to be awesome. A uh, question from Stuart says the LRA meter. So Studio One has in its built-in loudness m- meter, it has LUFS and it also has LRA. Um, can you speak to that? Just what that means and what we should glean from that number? Yes. Providing the next question is a mixing question. <laughs> Fair. Man, you get loud this man. It's a can of worms. Um, the uh, So I used to think that LR, so, so Loudness Penalty Studio, which we were talking about earlier, has changed or is changing, I think, my opinion of LRA. I used to think LRA stands for Loudness Range, um, and it's intended to give you an indication of the amount of difference between the loudest and the quietest moments mm-hmm. in a piece of audio. Right, so if you have a low LRA, it means that there's a very consistent loudness all the way through. If you have a large LRA, which is like um, I don't know, well, it depends on the music. Uh, then th- it means there's more contrast. The whole LUFS thing was originally designed for for film, basically, and for that reason, I so so you know the LRA in films is going to be huge, right? Because you could have explosions right. and then you can have dialogue. Um, and I used to think it was not that helpful for uh, music, but if I can, let me try sharing my screen just so I can, mm-hmm. this would be easier if I, if I show you guys and it's kind of interesting. Um, share screen. Um, yep. 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 Now I think I can just, this one will probably do. There you go. Let me uh, broaden this out. So this is an album that I was mastering recently. Um, and so, yeah, Joe said it briefly, but so the top of these blocks is the, the, the peak level, if I turn loudest matching off so you can see the original loudness, you can see they're all peaking up near near zero, not at zero, but minus one typically. Um, the pink line is the integrated loudness, which is the overall loudness. So you can see overall this song is louder, this one is quieter, this one is even quieter. Um, so, I mean, you know, I'm not mastering everything to minus 14. <laughs> um, but the the loudness range is the white bit, right? So the top of that white area is the 5% loudest moments in each song. And the bottom of that white area is the 10% quietest moments of each song, which is how LRA works. So the LRA tells you the difference between the loudest and the quietest. Um, and that's not that useful because all it tells us is that there's more variety in this song than there is in this one, for example. Mm-hmm. right? And it's like, well, that's just a musical mm-hmm. comment. It's like there is no right answer for what should mm-hmm. the variety be. Mm-hmm. It depends on the song. But what I've noticed is the top of the LRA, it's the 5% loudest moments, right? When you loudness match stuff, um, ignore this. Well, let me switch it to Apple so that we can get a better match because there's, there you go. Um, so now they're all playing back at the same loudness and you can see how much they've been turned down, by the way, by the pink arrows there. So like 4.3 loudness penalty on that one. This one hasn't changed at all. My bet is if we played that song, the loudest moments of that are going to sound louder than any of these other ones, right? Because it's the top of the LRA. So I'm changing my opinion of whether LRA is useful or not. I think it actually tells us where the loudest moments of the song are. And it's why when you have something that's got much more extreme contrasts, everything gets turned down. It's why a a song with more balanced dynamics can actually end up sounding louder, Mm -hmm. Um, which is something that I've been saying for years. um, And people keep pushing back on it. But I'm, um, as I say, I'm planning to do some some more videos. I won't waste any more time on on this stream with that. But um, if you guys are interested in all of this, just keep an eye on my YouTube channel. I'll be showing, kind of playing some examples and, and showing how this works. Um, and yeah, so far, pretty much you can kind of look at this and go, oh, that one is probably going to sound loudest at the loudest moments. And it's funny because that's one of, I happen to know that's one of the quieter songs. Um, Mm -hmm. not a huge, it's not like this one is big and full of drums and stuff. This is just, I think, strings and voices, um, which is this weird thing that sometimes happens where quieter Mm -hmm. things end up sounding louder. So yeah, Mm -hmm. there we go. Yeah, I totally get that. Uh, because a couple more questions and we're going to, call it a day, um, especially because it's late over where Ian is. Um, 
Salvatore says, I'm new to mixing. So my question is, why does an instrument drop out when I restart the mix? Am I doing something wrong? Uh, that I have no idea. That I don't get what you mean by drop out. Um, let's go to George. Uh, no, hang on. There was another one. The Cleed says, can you speak to cons- about considerations for acoustic tracks that have one instrument and vocal? How to judge what levels to aim at in regard to Spotify, etc." I mean, to me, the bigger, bigger question is, can we get it all to sound good? And can we get it loud enough? Um, but as far as what to aim for, I know Ian says not to aim for specific targets, but I'm trying to at least get it up above where they're going to turn it down to. So if they're going to turn it down to minus 14, I don't want it to be lower than that. Um, but I, if it's just a guitar vocal, I probably don't want it to be much like super higher than that either. Because if you go super loud, then like if it's louder than the next album that has drums and bass, that's going to feel weird, right? Kind of like what Ian was just saying. So it, to me, if it's just a guitar vocal, I don't feel a lot of pressure to do a lot in mastering. Like the mix is the main, the main like hero of the story. And then mastering is just kind of trying to get it, get it up into that loudness mark that I want without doing a whole lot more to it. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that. I think as always, it depends what the song is, mm-hmm. you know, so if it's a kind of gentle acoustic ballad with a, you know, what's a finger picking kind of style or, you know, mm-hmm. I'm not a guitarist, so apologies to all the guitarists. Um, then actually, I think, I mean, you, you saw on that um, album I just shared there, there were some songs that were down at minus 16, mm-hmm. right? And they just... Um, and in fact, I'm going to be using that for the thing tomorrow, the, this talk I'm giving, because they're talking about AI. And one of my comments on the AI is even when the EQ is kind of right, one of the things they do is they turn up the quiet songs way too much because mm-hmm. the AI doesn't know anything mm-hmm. about albums. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, that's one of the, the that's why people are still currently better, <laughs> um, in my opinion. <laughs> um, but so, so I mean, I would even say that for, for something that's, you know, I mean, if it's, uh, okay. Psycho Killer by Talking Heads, the live version, right, is coming into my mind because I went to see the film when it was re-released recently. Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. it's like David Byrne is singing at the top of his lungs and he's hammering away at this guitar. That's a loud... Mm -hmm. So that one you definitely want to be above minus 14 so that even if it gets turned down, it's still as loud as it can be. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, if it's much more gentle and um, kind of, you know, a a ballad kind of feel, then I'm quite happy for it to to be lower even. Um, it's so just very briefly for my guy, my suggestion, I don't like it. Well, I don't like giving overall numbers, but my, sure. I mentioned it in passing before my recommendation for a good place to be with all of this stuff is if the loud moments are at minus 10 with the short term LUFS. So LUFS has three different types. There's mm-hmm. momentary integrated, which is the overall number, but the short term is a kind of three second average. And it's kind of similar to that VU level or the, or the RMS level that we used to be used to use. Um, so I find that mo- ha- most helpful for, for musical stuff. If the loud bits are around m- minus 10 and then you just re- judge the rest musically, you know, it's, you, you just kind of, you get it so that everything sounds good to you at the loud sections and then make sure that when it eases back for the verse or for the quiet mm-hmm. sections, it's there enough. It's not kind of dropping away. Um, yeah. And take it from there. And my experience is that with, if you use that approach, you'll be in a great place and if the song doesn't go as musically loud as one of the others then you just say okay so that's the loudest moment of that song this one doesn't quite get there so it's just back a little bit you know Mm -hmm. um yeah that's great all right everybody i think we are talked out for now but we'd love for y'all to join us and we'll do more talking so the live streams will be at the same time on Tuesday next week, we'll do the mix. The following week will be the master. And then there's even a bonus one that's a few months later for to have us listen to your stuff and offer feedback. So it can be your mix of anything. It can be the song from the course. It can be something crazy and different. Uh, we're open to any of it. But head over to the website you can see on the screen. Um, come join us. Uh, you have about a week to sign up. But go ahead and if you join now, you'll get the tracks. You can start working on your mix now. And then we will kick things off one week from today. Ian, thanks for being here. You got something to say. Go. I was just going to say that Joe didn't mention one of the other cool things about this is that I'm going to be joining Joe on his stream to mm-hmm. keep an eye on the chat. You guys will be able to answer questions. I'll interrupt him and annoy him and yes. um, make annoying comments. And then he's going to return the favor for me when I'm mastering the following week. So it's a, yes, it's a full interactive uh, process. Um, and, because realistically, uh, like Ian has to deal with any mistakes I make. Right. 
and then I have to be mad about anything he does to my mix that I thought was perfect. So it's, it's going to be a great, you don't get that a lot, right? Either I'm mastering my own thing or it goes off and it just comes back and I don't have to see the in-between bits where he's like, oh, this guy. Um, well, so and I think fun. one of the cool things about this is we're going to be able to show, because, you know, the reality when I'm working with clients is there is some feedback, but I, I don't always kick stuff back and say, no, it's rubbish, do it again. Um, but sometimes there's a, hey, what about, did you mean this to be the way that it, and, you know, so people are going to get to see all of that kind of process as well, you know, because there will be the opportunity mm-hmm. for me to say, I'm curious, are you, are you doing, why are you doing that? What's, how do you think that's going to work? And then we can see whether it turns out that way in the mastering and whether actually we end up wanting to make any mixed tweaks. I think it's, I think people are going to get a lot out of it. Um, I hope so. I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, I'm excited. It's going to be fun. So, uh, y'all can join us. Um, either way, I'm hanging out with Ian for the next few weeks, and that's a win for me. So we're good. Likewise, exactly. <laughs> All right, I got to go listen to some Steely Dan. The rest of you, go check it out. Um, this whole video will be available. So just come back to this exact sp- spot. It'll be just a regular video, and you can rewatch the whole thing as many times as you need to. And share it with your friends who you think might also like it. Yeah, and share it with your enemies too. <laughs> yeah, share it with people who. <laughs> But all the people who hate us, just to annoy them. Just tag someone whose stuff is just way too loud. And but don't don't explain it. There it is. Yeah. Fantastic. Right. I'm gonna press end stream. So That'll work. thanks, Joe. Really enjoyed Bye, it. Everybody. See you. Cheers.